for that sound. And we are good to go. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Bonnie Walsh, and I am the uh, senior producer and writer of a series of short science films about climate feedback loops called Climate Emergency Feedback Loops. And I'm with Melanie Wallace, who's our impact producer. And I'm going to just say a few words about the project and then hand it over to Melanie. And the plan is to give you a little background show a bunch of clips from the films to give you a sense of what they're like, and then show you the curriculum that we have on our website and kind of walk you through some things. And then we can answer any questions that anyone has. Um, so the project started as a <clears throat> an attempt to answer the question, what are feedback loops and what's causing global warming to warm even more like what what's the mechanism behind it and so we were tasked to make these films that are very science oriented and we looked at different areas where feedback loops were happening and we came up with an introduction film and then a film about forests one about permafrost one about the albedo effect and one about atmosphere and so in each of the films we cover those particular areas and explain about feedback loops and we've we feature 12 renowned climate scientists, and it's narrated by Richard Gere, so um, he offers a nice a nice soundtrack. Um, and so we actually launched the five films in January of 2021 at a worldwide event with the Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg, who had a conversation for the first time ever they, they met. And um, that was a really exciting way to launch the project. And then with Melanie's help, we got a distributor and we created a one hour version called Earth Emergency. And that aired on PBS last December and again last April. And it's been sold all around the world. Um, so that gives you a little background on the topic. And I'm going to hand it over to Melanie now to talk about all the outreach we've been doing with, with both the shorts and the one hour broadcast version. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you for having us here to speak to the Science Teachers of Nevada. Yay! This is such a great opportunity for us. Um, so, yeah, so I'll give you just a little background. Um, I was the senior series producer for NOVA for a good many years and worked on climate change films there for PBS. And um, I can actually just say the first film that we did at NOVA was in the, in the mid-80s on uh, climate change. And I was able to interview Al Gore in his Senate office long before he even made his uh, his film. And the conversation is ongoing and the intensity now, of course, has, has uh, increased quite a lot. But one of the things that were important to us as filmmakers was to make sure the films were available for teachers and available for educational use. So we made a arrangement with an organization called Journeys in Film that specializes in creating science-based curriculum for documentary films. And they have a great website and they have a lot of offerings on their website. And so it was very exciting for us because we were able to take what we had learned you know, as filmmakers and then collaborate with them because they have a big deep background in education. So the curriculum exists, it's there. We've only recently translated it into Spanish. So that will be there soon. So it'll be available in Spanish. And um, also our films, the short films in particular are available in I think 27 different languages with subtitles. So they're meant to be used widely in a variety of educational situations. So early on when I came onto the project with the mission of spreading the word, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's in England and um, who knows a lot about climate change and environmental uh, documentaries. And he said, you know, what if we shared this with my friend, Prince Charles? I've worked with him on some climate change films. So yeah, okay, sure. So he sends a letter and then we don't hear anything. And then one day we get this beautiful letter, you know, email, but beautiful from the, the 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 royalty around Prince Charles saying, the prince now knows what he's going to do at COP26 and he would like to invite your film to be shown there. Would you like that? <laughs> it's like, Bonnie, Bonnie, what should we do? <laughs> oh, yes, we would. So the filmmakers were invited to Glasgow. We were able to show, this was for the one hour film. They met Prince Charles, who we can now say, the King of England has seen our film, which, you know, I've been on Nova a long time. I could never say that. <laughs> um, 
anyway, so that kind of got uh, the film launched in a way uh, that was for the hour film, but we also are, at the same time are trying to get people to know about the short films as a, good resources for educators. And we collaborated with the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, and they did a series of six webinars with scientists uh, for audiences who signed up, anybody, uh, to start talking about the details of what's going on in each of the different films. And we've kind of continued that idea of making partnerships and, and creating webinars. And we've had some really interesting um, experiences with Rotary International. And with them right now, we're creating a, what we hope will be a climate emergency toolkit um, that will include the films plus resources for, uh, for everybody, you know, for teachers as well. And um, that will be available, as they said, you know, we have 39,000 chapters around the world. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, go Rotary, yep. <laughs> So, and we're also working with school districts and, um, and um, we've had a lot of different community opportunities um, through Bonnie's uh, efforts. We were able to show one of the films um, to the local legislature in Massachusetts, which is where we're located. And it was on Zoom and we had scientists and many of the legislators themselves came, but then also their staffers. So that's a really interesting idea for us to try to get the films in front of the people who are making policy decisions. And we're gonna continue in that path as well. Um, and what else? We are working with the Physicians for Social Responsibility and creating webinars with them around the health effects of climate change. So um, that's useful for you know medical people and. Um, we're also working, um, we were invited by the Cambridge uh, Science Fair to show our films at, um, at the MIT Science Museum. And then we were able to do a webinar, you know, with them and talk about the film. And, you know, so we're, we're branching out into a lot of different ways, but honestly, teachers and educators are our primary interest. Right. And we're working outside the US. We have colleagues in Ecuador who are helping us spread the word. And so we're very open outside the US as well as in the US. And it's a great, great honor for us to be speaking to the teachers of Nevada. Bonnie. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. So I, I know there are only uh, three of you on besides Audra. Um, so I just wanna make sure we, we, do, we serve your needs. I was going to show clips from like two minute clips from each of the five films. Is that, is that something you guys want to see? I can't see any of your faces, so I don't know if, yes, okay. <laughs> Lila says yes. I don't know if Holly and Valentina are, are listening. Oh, Holly says yes. Great. Okay, good. So I'm <laughs> going to share my screen then. Um, I just know sometimes when people are on Zoom, they're like, I know I do this. I'm like cooking or something and I'm just listening, but I, I'm not ready to like sit down and watch something necessarily. So I will go ahead and share my screen. And the first clip I'm gonna show you is from our introduction film. And you'll see that the purpose of it is to teach people who might not know. And, and you'll see it's really geared toward young kids, like sixth graders and up, because it's the language is very simple. We really try to explain the concept in a simple way. We don't throw around big scientific terms. You know, we really try to ground people in basic science. So you'll see in this first clip, um, I'm coming in a little into the film, um, but it it's, it's kind of establishes this idea of feedback loops. And we use this graphic over and over again of this these arrows going around in a circle to show the vicious cycle. This affects this affects this affects this. So you'll you'll see that. So let me um, share my screen. And here's the first clip. But it's more than our emissions heating the globe. Something else is at work here. The rising temperatures are setting in motion Earth's own natural warming mechanisms that then feed upon themselves. George Woodwell, a distinguished scientist and a lion of the environmental movement, has been sounding the alarm about them for the past 50 years. In a 1989 Scientific American article, he wrote that warming caused by human activity, rapid now, may become even more rapid as a result of the warming itself. A feedback that everybody is familiar with is an audio feedback where if you put a microphone too close to a speaker, you get this terrible high-pitched screaming. And that happens because the sound comes out of the speaker and it goes back into the microphone. 
That's called a positive feedback because it amplifies the loop. Instead of the guitar, emissions from fossil fuels are the input which add heat-trapping gases to the atmosphere, raising Earth's temperature and setting in motion self-perpetuating warming loops, warming as a result of the warming itself. That ever-growing screeching noise is an apt analogy for the damage that human-caused feedback loops are wreaking on the planet. Scientists have identified dozens of feedback loops already in motion. It's imperative that we understand them if we're going to solve the climate crisis. As the climate warms, forests, once removers of carbon, release it back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, or CO2. Frozen ground in the northern hemisphere thaws and emits CO2 and methane. These are the kinds of feedback loops that lead to further warming, triggering the release of even more heat-trapping gases and raising the temperature even higher. In this series, we will highlight four of the major feedback loops impacting climate. The melting of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, increased drought and fires in the world's forests, the decay of organic matter from permafrost thaw in the Northern Hemisphere, and disruptions to the jet stream and our global weather. Each amplifies warming, and combined, they are spinning out of control. We can't hear you. Sorry, I muted myself and I forgot. Thank you. <laughs> I was saying it, that was the introduction film and it goes on to talk about um, periods in Earth's history where there was, where it got really cold called snowball Earth and when it got really hot called hothouse Earth and basically saying, yes, these things have happened without man and woman's interference, but this is the first time that we really should be in heading into an ice age and we're not, we're warming. So we're trying to make the case that this is caused by people, not natural. So that goes on. Um, does anyone have any questions about that film? I'll go ahead and share the next one then. Um, this one is about permafrost. And this little clip explains about what's happening in the, in the Arctic. Last summer, while working in her usual field location in Alaska, Natalie witnessed a remarkable acceleration of permafrost melting. First of all, it was very, very warm. It was 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the tundra. There were places where we walked where my foot fell into the ground because there was no longer any ground structure because there was, the permafrost was thawing. I've never seen change happening that quickly from one year to the next. To understand how this thawing will impact the global climate, Natali and her team collect permafrost cores from different locations across the Arctic. In the lab, she analyzes their carbon content and composition to determine how much gas will be released when the permafrost thaws. These cores were taken from a location that has really organic, rich, deep, peaty soils. And you can tell that when you look at this core because it's, it's really dark brown, and that dark brown color means that it holds a lot of carbon. The thawing permafrost not only impacts the climate through the release of greenhouse gases, it can entirely transform the landscape, as Natalie has seen in Duvani Yar, Russia. I had never seen permafrost thaw and ground collapse of that magnitude. You know, I remember driving up to it on the boat and it was like, wow, this huge cliff, many, many stories high. You see these really, really fine roots that have been frozen for 40,000 years. Once they're thawed, they'll decompose in a year. Okay. Um... I'll show you one more clip, and then, I, then I'd like to show you the uh, curriculum, the science curriculum, and we can go through that. So I'll show you one more clip. Um, this one will be from the albedo 
film explaining what albedo is and why it matters. For tens of thousands of years, the delicate balance of Earth's climate has allowed human life on our planet to thrive. Today, that equilibrium is at risk as one of the most important cooling mechanisms, the albedo effect, or Earth's reflectivity, is threatened. At Earth's poles, snow and ice reflect up to 85% of the sun's rays away from the surface and back into space, helping to keep the planet from becoming too hot. But over the past few decades, this natural mirror has begun to break down as fossil fuel emissions raise temperatures, melt snow and ice cover, and reduce the planet's albedo. As the planet loses its ability to reflect sunlight, a dangerous warming feedback loop is triggered. The most alarming change is happening in the far north where the temperature rise is causing the snow cover and sea ice to rapidly disappear. Don Perovich is a sea ice geophysicist at Dartmouth College. For the past 30 years, he's been documenting big changes in the Arctic. There's always been this annual cycle. The ice grows, uh, usually say for nine or 10 months of the year, and then melts for a couple of months. What's changing now is the timing. The melting is starting earlier, the freezing is starting later. We have much less coverage every month of the year, particularly at the end of summer. Global warming from human-caused emissions of heat-trapping gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and others, is increasing the temperature in the Arctic two to three times faster than the rest of the planet. Warming is then amplified by the loss of albedo as the reflective ice and snow disappear, exposing the dark ocean underneath. Say it's April and we're flying above the Arctic and we look down at the sea ice cover, it's covered by snow. It's bright and it's white. Now, summer comes, that snow melts, you get more open ocean, you're absorbing much more heat. Instead of reflecting 85%, you're absorbing 90%. And so you're replacing one of the best natural reflectors, snow, with one of the worst, the open ocean. Now, instead of reflecting the sunlight, the ocean absorbs it, heats up, and melts more ice, exposing more dark ocean, which absorbs more sunlight in an amplifying cycle. Okay. Um, I, do, I have a couple more clips, but I think we'll see if there's time at the end, because what I want to do is... First of all, oh, thank you, Lila, for saying that. They're amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're trying to get the word out to teachers that they're available. So I'm going to put the website right here in the chat. It's feedbackloopsclimate.com. So all, all five films, which range in length from eight to 14 minutes, are there for the watching for free. You don't have to pay for them. Um, and then also what's there, if you, if you want to go to the website, you could... Um, look along with me. Uh, we have, hold on, I'm gonna get our, um, I'm gonna get the, are you seeing my desktop? Yes, yes. Okay. cool. All right, so here's, um, here it is. So this is the 131 page curriculum that we had journeys in film make based on the series. Here's our beautiful poster at the beginning. <laughs> and then we go through each of the five films. Um, and if you want to if you want to follow along, you can go to our website. If you click on educational, it's there as a PDF. You can download it. You can use it. As Melanie said, we're going to have the PDF of the Spanish version up soon for Spanish speakers who can also download it for free. Um, so we had um, we, a bunch of teachers worked on this, science teachers, and they did a great job. So you'll see that we go through five lesson plans um, around forest, permafrost, atmosphere, albedo, and regreening the earth. Um, so at the beginning, we have sort of an introduction. Tell me if I'm going too fast. It's just a lot to get through. So I just want to 
go quickly. A letter from Liam Neeson, who's on their board. Why we must act. This is the name of the broadcast film, Earth Emergency. Um, so here's where we kind of introduce the whole series of the five short films and what each of them goes over. And then um, the credits. And a, a letter to the teacher, which they always do, about what the what's in the curriculum, what each of the lessons cover. Um, and so if you want to look at lesson one, Forest, you'll see we have the enduring understandings, the essential questions, note, notes to the teacher, their handouts. There's a link to the series. And then there are various handouts that are part of this. There's um, activities and lesson plans for teachers to use. And then at the end, we have additional resources, a couple of, you know, each each lesson has a few links to resources that will help. Like Project Drawdown is a great website about solutions. Our films don't really get into solutions. They're really the science of feedback loop. So um, if you want to have the kids, students look at solutions, that's a good website. <clears throat> and then you see the common core standards that are addressed by each lesson and the next gen oops there's a typo there i just noticed the next gen science standards it should read <laughs> addressed by the lesson <laughs> hopefully everyone can figure that out um and then the materials you'll need you know the different handouts that are here the the explanations so i'm sure you guys are very familiar with what these kind of curricula look like um so this is probably pretty standard but there's all kinds of fun activities. It really gets into the science, learning about like, for instance, in the film, we really explain how trees work, how they absorb carbon. And so the lesson around forests tries to, you know, take that um, lesson further and really talk about the whole carbon cycle, the water cycle. Um, and then we have questions in the back about feedback loops. See, so here's the carbon cycle. Here's photosynthesis and transpiration, um, tree structure. So the film doesn't go into all this stuff. I mean, we talk about how trees absorb carbon and why forests are important for storing carbon, but we don't we don't get into this level of detail about trees and wood and the carbon cycle. So this is all great ancillary material, or our films are good ancillary material to go with this with these lessons. Um, root systems and then this gets into the feedback loops how forests you know forest diebacks how that happens from acid rain beetle damage um our film does get into the three types of forests we talk about tro tropical forests temperate forests and boreal forests so that those are in the film and what what feedback loops are happening within each of those forests <laughs> Um, so more, you know, scanning electron microscope slides of wood. So you can see you could go really do a deep dive <laughs> around forests. Okay, so that's kind of the gist of how the guides work. You can just scroll through it on your own and um, you know, here here's the here's lesson two permafrost, and again, it's the same it's the same layout um, where you're able to do a much deeper dive than what the film shows. And here are the Common Core standards addressed, the Next Gen Science standards addressed with the same typo. <laughs> Melanie, we'll have to fix that. Um, and then again, a whole bunch of lessons. So I don't, you know, I don't think I need to go through every every lesson with you guys. You can um you can go through it. But does anyone have any questions about it or observations or it's pretty clear cut? Lonnie, are there hands-on experiments for yes. to do with students? Yep. There are hands-on experiments, there are materials that you need for those. Yep, there's all kinds of hands-on lessons. And you see that right here on the page, there's a list of all the materials you need to do the do the hands-on experiments. You might so, yeah. want to, Bonnie, you might want to mention yeah. that the discussion guides as well, which is- Oh, separate. yeah. Thank you. There are also 
we had, in addition to the science curriculum for students grade six through 12, we, we have broader discussion guides for that are more geared toward adult community groups or maybe teenagers, just to kind of get the discussion started after they screen the films. They ask questions about kind of seeing if they learned what they were supposed to learn from the film and then more open-ended discussion questions. And I, I do want to point out that the at the end of this is kind of cool because, okay, you can see all these, see, here's a, here's a real hands-on experiment <laughs> about simulating the effect of microbial decomposition and gas release uh, in thawing permafrost. So that's kind of cool. But at the end, what's nice is unlike the films, we have this kind of solutions chapter at the end. There's the albedo. Okay. Um, so regreening the earth is our last one. So it's really about um, kind of what do we do now? What do we do now? We have all the science, you know, what do, how do we address the problem? What does it mean to regreen the earth? You know, how can students participate in bringing about environmental change locally and globally in their, their activities for them to do in their own towns or their states to get them involved? So this is nice because it kind of takes it to the next level. Um, they learn about young environmental activists so they can see role models. Um, they talk about um, does, if it seems possible for them to replicate or learn from, you know, regreening your own community, what would be required to do that. So there's all kinds of hands-on activity that take it to the next level. Um, so that's the... Um, So that's the curriculum, basically. Um, lots of interesting activities and lessons and handouts. Um, so maybe if no one has any questions, I'll just show the next couple clips from the films just to give you another taste of what we cover. So I would like to know yeah. how this um, helps out with our area because our area is going through major, major problems with water. Mm. And so how can you put that in? How will it help with our water? Mm. That's a good question. Or losing water. Yeah. Yeah. Where back um, east, they're getting too much. Right. I know every part of the country has a different issue, don't they? Uh -huh. I know in California and other places, Colorado, it's the fires, the wildfires. And this really addresses that in the forest film. We don't really get into water very much, though, because it's not a feedback loop. It's not a climate feedback loop. It's a consequence, but it's not a, a loop. We really only talked about things that make the warming worse. Um, and we didn't... Um, we didn't really do anything of brown water. Melanie, do you know of any feedback loops around water? Well, it's related to um, when, you know, to the atmosphere and, right. you know, the effect of the warming in the atmosphere and how yeah. that's related to the oceans. Right. So right. in that one, you know, you, yeah. you kind of include water, but. Um, right. Like, that, all you know, I'm just saying the fact that there was a drought is because of a feedback loop. Right. So the clip I'll show next is from the atmosphere film, and it explains how the jet stream works and how because of warming in the Arctic, the jet stream is is kind of getting stuck in one place for a long time. And that's what's keeping dry places drier and wet places wetter. So that is the feedback loop that Melanie mentioned. So it, it is contributing to further drought. That's for sure. All right. Let me show that clip. The jet stream is this river of wind high over our heads, up where the jets fly, that encircles the northern hemisphere. And that jet stream is responsible for creating pretty much all the weather that we experience in this part of the world. To illustrate, imagine a layer of air extending from the warm south to the cold north. Warm air expands, so the layer over the south rises up higher than the air over the north. 
If you sat on top of this layer of air in the south looking north, it would appear to slope downward. Because of gravity, the warm air higher up flows downhill just like water flows down a mountain. This downward movement creates a south to north wind. But because the earth is spinning, this wind gets turned to the east and becomes a west to east flow of wind. That's the jet stream. The greater the temperature difference between the north and south air masses, the faster and stronger the jet stream winds blow. Historically, Arctic air has been much colder than the air to the south, keeping the jet stream fairly straight with relatively small north-south meanders. But with the Arctic warming at two to three times the rate as the rest of the globe, that temperature differential has decreased. This weakens the jet stream winds, causing them to take larger swings north and south, which in turn impacts the weather. This is the feedback loop. We're warming the Arctic, we're reducing the winds of the jet stream, we're seeing it take these bigger north-south swings, which then transfers even more heat from the south to the north into the Arctic, which makes it even warmer, which weakens the winds more, and it sets up this vicious cycle. The perception for all of us on the ground here is that it feels like our weather is getting stuck in one pattern for a long time. Okay. <clears throat> the next thing uh, she says, <laughs> which I cut before, she said the dry places are getting drier, the wet places are getting wetter. So that's that kind of explains how the weather is getting affected. Yeah, so I'll show one more clip then. This is, um, this is actually at the end of the forest film. Um, I mentioned that the forest film really gets into how, you know, how stores, how trees store carbon and all the feedback loops that are happening in forests, um, the beetles, the fires, the drought. And in the boreal forest, it's even worse because carbon up there is stored in the ground and that carbon is burning. And so it's it's a combination of the permafrost thaw and all this carbon stored underground burning. And the, in the tropical forest, it's, you know, that the rain, that the Amazon is being deforested and, um, and that's leading to huge problems. Um, the story in the temperate forest isn't so much a feedback loop, it's more about how um, deforestation logging is cutting down old growth trees <clears throat> that are storing a lot of carbon. And it takes a new tree 10 to 20 years to start storing carbon. So cutting down an old tree and a new tree is not the same. You want to preserve these old growth trees because they're the ones storing massive amounts of carbon. And it's not the same to cut those down and then plant, plant a new tree because then it takes another 20 years of time and lost opportunity for storing carbon, um, waiting for that tree to get old. Um, so this film picks up at the end after we've explained all that. And we try at the end of each film to give a little hope of how we might reverse the feedback loop so it isn't getting worse and worse and worse. But if we do certain things, we can actually try to stop the heating and cool the planet. So I'll play the end of the forest film now, which explains that. And you'll see uh, George Woodwell, who you saw at the beginning in the introduction clip, who the, the Woodwell Climate Center Research Center in Woods Hole, Massachusetts is named for. And we used a lot of their climate scientists in the, in the films. So here's the end to the forests. With the clock ticking, it comes down to how we manage temperate forests. Use them for commercial purposes or keep them intact to cool the planet. While human activity has kicked off natural warming loops, human ingenuity could reverse their direction, turning them into cooling feedbacks instead. It would mean protecting and expanding forests, preserving marshes, grasslands, and all natural habitats. Using agricultural practices that store carbon instead of releasing it, 
and letting trees and plants do their job of taking carbon out of the air. This would lower Earth's temperature and kick in a self-perpetuating cooling feedback loop. George Woodwell was an early pioneer warning about fossil fuel use, setting off warming feedback loops five decades ago. He's convinced the solution lies with nature's own ability to cool the planet. We can store carbon in life. If we want to be optimistic, we have to be very progressive in our transition away from fossil fuels and into a new green world. But it takes imagination, interest, and a recognition of the reality of an Earth that is failing at the moment. We can't allow it to be too late. Okay, so that's um, that's the last clip that I have, and that you'll see that's how they end. We really try to steer clear of politics in these films. We're really not trying to be political, but we do try to, you know, at the end we say like we got to do something about this. You know, we show people protesting. We say, you know, vote for the people that can make a difference. But we that's as political as we get because it's really not about politics. It's about saving the planet. Um, so does anyone have, I know some people came in late. Um, does anyone have any, any questions? Um, do you want to take a look at the discussion guides? Would that be useful or? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll just website, you know, you can easily. Yeah. Let me show you the website and that way you'll get a sense of what it looks like. Let me see if I can, um... hold on one sec before I, let me just get it up before I uh, open it. I have some colleagues who teach in community colleges and they find the discussion guides very useful in that oh, education. Okay. okay, here we go. Let me share my screen now. Okay, so this is the this is our homepage, and you'll see that we have um, we have a little recommendation by Greta Thunberg on the homepage. <laughs> um, we have the introduction film here that you can just play, and then we have the other four films right below it. And right on the top, we say educational materials are available, so you can just click on that. Here's the grade six through twelve curriculum guide that I opened before, and then these are all the film discussion guides in case you want to use them individually. And then here's a complete one that has questions for all um, five programs. So this is a much shorter, this isn't the curriculum. It's just really like very brief, like introduction to feedback loop um, and then questions for each film. And, and as I mentioned before, some of it is sort of <clears throat> trying to glean from people what they learn from the films. And then we open it up about like, what should we do? And uh, do you think we can continue living the way we have been? And, you know, what are some possible action steps that people could take? And then we have a lot of resources here too, for both reading about the problem and reading about the solutions, which again is drawdown because that's the big solutions website. So we do that for each of the five films. Um, kind of an introduction, recapping the main learning points, and then posing questions, and then offering resources. So that's this, that's kind of the abridged version of the, the, the kind of non-academic so much version of the curriculum, which is clearly more designed for kids in the classroom. This is more kind of for teens or, or group community kind of screenings. 
Yeah. So those are those are our materials. And they're all free. They're all accessible. We really encourage people to use them. We want them spread around the world. <laughs> um, you know, Bonnie, we haven't translated the discussion guides into Spanish. I think we have to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how much they'd be they'd be used versus the curriculum, but yeah, we should look into it. Well, um, and in case you came late, the films are all the films on the website are captioned in twenty seven languages, which is amazing. So any kind of student, you know, whatever kind of language their first language is, they can get it. Hopefully, <laughs> it'll be the we'll have their language there. Um, well, and we are adding languages. Different people will get in touch with us. Like Bonnie got a, a message from somebody in Albania. Yes. Can I translate this into Albanian? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So people are offering. We're we're saying sure. <laughs> Go ahead. So yeah, we've um, we've been accumulating languages, which is great because we do want them used all over the world. Right. So um, yeah, and our message really seems to have struck a chord. I think the way the films are kind of, they're pretty simply explained and well illustrated and scientists are all very articulate and speaking in English <laughs> to people. So I think, you know, people are pretty excited about these films. I mean, it's great that Rotary International is working with us to create this toolkit that will be used in hopefully in schools all over the world. Yeah our hope and uh you know if anyone knows of anywhere who might benefit from knowing about these films and curriculum please spread the word yeah anything else melanie well there's so many other things but i think that will sum up where we are at the moment <laughs> yeah. we are just very yes. good grateful that teachers are teaching about climate change. Yes. And I don't, I, you probably already know about this, but there's a website called Subject to Climate. Are they part of your Nevada presentation, Audra? Do you know them? If no? they are, this is the first time hearing of it. So I think it's great that you mentioned the resource. So Subject to Climate is a website devoted to providing for teachers an easy access to excellent and vetted climate change materials. And so our, our films are included in their website. So, um, and they, they have been advising the state of New Jersey who's made it a requirement for all students and teachers to teach climate change every year, right? It's a, it's a thing. And other states are looking at that as well, but, but New Jersey has been working with subject to climate because they have such a good resource base. And it's, it's free also for teachers. So it's a great website to know about and to share with other teachers. And then mm -hmm. our, our films are there too. And there's also an online resource called CLEAN, the Climate Literacy it's Environmental Awareness Network. And they all, our films are also posted, you know, the links to our website is, are, is posted there and they also have great climate materials for free. <clears throat> so they're a great resource too. And they have these week, they have these bi-weekly or every other weekly call-ins where people that we presented at once where teachers can call in and be on this presentation call where we people talk about things, it's share true. information. To help. help teachers get access to resources more easily. Yeah. So they're they're a good thing to know about as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we're done, you guys can have a little break before your next <laughs> session, I guess. Yeah. <laughs>